I'd like to start by thanking Eric and the presentation platform team and all the other people at Yahoo who helped organize this conference. I think the last two days have been great. I think you did an excellent job. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to thank all of you for being here, especially uh, the ones of you for whom getting here is a lot of trouble. I really appreciate that, that you made the journey. I'm really glad you're here. Hope to see you next time at your place. Um, so now uh, you're going to get a quality presentation. Um, we're going to cover the whole range of human emotion from the, uh, from the heights of, of creative ecstasy all the way down to the depths of technical despair. And, and as you'd expect, we're going to start with the latter. <laughs> um, I don't know how many of you have heard of the software crisis. The software crisis was a topic that dominated the computer industry trade press for about a decade. Um, the, it was discovered in the late 60s, um, and they noticed that an alarming percentage of software projects were failing for one reason or another. Uh, it was very common for software projects to go seriously over budget, to go seriously over time, that the finished software is unreliable, uh, that the requirements are not fully met, that it's unmaintainable, or in some cases, the project completely fails and there is no usable deliverable as, at all. They didn't notice at the time that they were also insecure. That's because in the late 60s, they hadn't started networking their computers together yet. Uh, if they had been doing that then, then that concern would certainly have been on the list. We are now in year 40 of the software crisis. <laughs> it was never solved. They never found, we never found a solution to the software crisis. We stopped reporting it just because it wasn't news anymore. You know, the software crisis is still going on. They kept it up for about a decade, and then the, the story died. But it's still true, and it's still a problem. And it's not reported in the same way that we don't report that the sun is going to exhaust its supply of hydrogen. There's not a lot you can do about it. You know, it's, it's a whole lot easier if you just ignore it. Um, but it's hard to ignore the software crisis because we still feel the consequence of it that it's hard to get projects finished and to get them finished reliably. At the time, there was a lot of speculation as to why was this happening. There were some people who thought it was happening because um, the machines were getting bigger and faster. And back when the machines were smaller and slower, it hadn't been a problem, or at least as much. It, it turned out that wasn't true, that um, software has always been hard. Um, that mainly it was getting harder because our ambitions were getting higher. Um, as the machines got more capable, we were demanding more of the machines, and the complexity of the projects was going up. And management of complexity is, is the basic problem. There are some people who were saying that the cause was due to uh, sort of a craft orientation of software rather than an engineering orientation. That they were complaining that in the old, old days, most programmers were trained as mathematicians and because nobody was being trained as programmers. And so they get these mathematicians and force them to, to write computer programs. But as the software industry started growing up, there just weren't enough mathematicians that could be pressed into doing it. Also, it turns out not all mathematicians can do it, and not all mathematicians want to do it. So they had to start pressing people from other disciplines to write this stuff. And there was a, a thought that they sort of tainted the, the talent pool by bringing in all these underqualified people. That was why the software crisis was happening. It turns out that an engineering discipline is extremely useful in doing this stuff, but the lack of engineering discipline was not the cause of the problem. That even with uh, a lot of uh, formal techniques and the development of software, the software crisis still persists. Fundamentally, the computer science or computer science has not taught us how to manage software projects. Uh, computer science has taught us a lot about how to design algorithms, how to uh, do measurement and scaling and, and a whole lot of other things, but hasn't taught us how to make software in the large effectively and reliably. Software construction is in some ways like conventional construction, and in some ways it's radically different. And if I want to build a wall, I can figure out the dimensions of the wall. I can figure out how many bricks I'm going to need. I can then um, determine how many brick layers I need. And, and I can build that wall pretty reliably. Can't do the same thing with software, because 
uh, the bricks of software have this strange interconnectedness, which doesn't allow us to uh, go parallel in, in the way that we can with ordinary construction. So the software crisis really has its roots in the nature of software itself. Software is powerful and malleable. And that is the blessing of software. It allows us to do a whole lot of things which you couldn't do otherwise. I mean, you might imagine, let's build an email client all out of discrete components. And there's just no way you could do it. It's just so complex. You could not build an email machine that, that had no software in it. Only software makes that a possible thing. But the flexibility and malleability of software is also its curse. It, it is what makes software hard to do. Programming is difficult, and I contend software is the most complicated stuff that humans know how to make. Perhaps it's even slightly more complicated than we know how to make. Um, one of the things that makes a, a uh, technical management of, of software difficult is the lack of metrics. We don't have any real way of measuring the quality of a project or its state of completeness. Um, we've got a few metrics like line of, lines of code, which is horribly inadequate. It do, uh, lines of code completed is not a measure of quality. It's not even a measure of completeness. It's very common that when 90% of the programming is done, when all the lines of code have been completed, that's often an indicator that the project's about half done. Um, you, you can't count the number of lines that you've done the same way that you can count the number of bricks that you've laid and be confident of, of how much you've done. And in fact, you can't really know how many lines is it going to take to get this thing finished. And you can't know how much time it's going to take to get those lines done. One of the reasons why estimation is difficult is because programmers are optimists. You ask a programmer, how much time is it going to take you? And it was, oh, I'll say oh, this many months or whatever. And said, well, can you do it in less? And go, yeah, why not? I'm a smart guy. <laughs> I ought to be able to do that in less. Programmers have to be optimists, because if you're not an optimist, I believe you just can't do this work. When, when you're looking into the pit of despair, trying to, <laughs> you have to have some irrational competence that tells you you're going to be able to make this work. No rational person can do software. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced of that. Um, as a consequence of that, programmers don't understand how they spend their time. We imagine that we spend most of our time typing programs. But I, I think if you were to take all of the finished, polished software that you finish in a year, you could probably type all that in in one day, maybe two. It wouldn't be a good day. I mean, it'd be a, <laughs> it'd be a really awful day. But if you just measure the lines of code that you accomplished, you can probably do that in a day or two. And then you have to ask a question, well, what were you doing the other 99% of the year? And we do a lot of really important things. A lot of it is what we've been talking about for the last two days. Uh, we're in meetings or in technical conversations with our colleagues that programming is more and more a social activity. Um, then the other thing we do is spend a lot of time staring at the screen saying, my god, what have I done? And trying to puzzle out how you're possibly going to get this thing to work. Um, that, that takes up a whole lot more time than typing. Um, but because programmers imagine that they spend most of their time in typing, when they look at processes for optimizing what they do, they are often skeptical of anything which is going to mean more keystrokes. Because they go, oh man, if I spend more keystrokes, you know, it might mean that I've got three days of, of, of typing that I have to do a year rather than the, the two. Um, we know from the first rule of optimization that you optimize in the place where you're spending time. It turns out programmers really aren't spending much time typing their software. Um, but that's where we look for stuff. You know, I want an IDE with autocomplete so I don't have to type all that stuff. It'll go so much faster, that'll really improve my productivity. And I think those particular improvements in productivity are negligible. That's not where the time is being spent. So programming is now a social activity. Uh, there are probably still exceptions, you know, lone solo programmers out there. Uh, that's not what goes on here. Here, programming is strictly a social activity. Even if you're the only person on, on your project, um, you still have a, a community that you interact with. You have an expectation that there are other people who are someday going to have to touch your code. Um, so being the lone wolf, you know, just going off by yourself, 
really is not what we do anymore. It's, it's, it's no longer appropriate behavior. Um, when we look at, at development of software, we have to consider the cost of innovation. You know, are we doing stuff that's been done before, or are we doing stuff that hasn't been done before? Um, there is a lot of programming activity which is mostly about doing stuff that's been done before. Like uh, most business programming, those guys have been rewriting the same program for 50 years. That's most of what happens, you know, where they've got this process where they've got their books and they got information flows in and flows out. It's endlessly complicated and lots of variations, but basically it's the same program that, that basically goes back to when the Medici's discovered double entry bookkeeping. Um, that's what they're writing. Um, the stuff that we're doing is not of that class. And so while there all are some methodologies which make the business stuff easier to do or easier to predict anyway, really don't apply to the kind of stuff that we do because basically everything we do, we're doing for the first time because there's such a high level of innovation in the stuff that we do here. And because of that high level of innovation, there's a high level of risk in the stuff that we're doing. Um, legacy is a really interesting thing in, in, in software. In any other industry, legacy is the wealth of practice and tradition in, in what you do. In software, legacy is a liability. It's the crap we did before we knew how to do this right. And the alarming thing about the trends in legacy today is that the age at which programs become legacy is getting younger and younger, even to the point where we have now seen programs which are considered legacy before they are completed. So that's alarming. I mean, th this is another reflection of the software crisis, that uh, uh, what we mean by legacy really means unmaintainable. And maintainability is increasingly important as we get more incremental. And we'll look at that in a moment. Now, the good news is that the, the t basic technology of software is not static. It, it's been evolving over time. Unfortunately, software is not governed by Moore's law. Software is governed by Murphy's law. So instead of having uh, an increase in capability every two years, it's more on the order of 20 years. Every, approximately every 20 years, we have some small leap forward in software capability. Um, which allows us to consider programs of greater complexity, um, and, and that's good. And it, it's coincidental that 20 years is roughly equivalent to a human generation. So it may be that there is an important corollary there, that, or a correlation, that um, we need a whole bunch of new people in order to come in without the bias and, and prejudices of the previous generation of programmers in order to get new software. Um, practices going, and we'll look at uh, some examples of that. So these leaps make it possible to implement projects of greater complexity, but adoption of, of the software leaps tends to be extremely slow. Um, the new technologies tend to uh, have a lot of controversy around them, a huge amount of reluctance generally to adopt them. So the adoption of the new technologies tends to be very slow. Uh, so let me give you an example. Uh, programming really starts with plug boards, which was the first time when it wasn't necessary to, to build a machine in order to, to change its um, characteristics. So this is what software used to look like. This is a plug board. Um, each of the holes represents an input or an output into some circuit, and you connect them with wires. This is spaghetti code. I mean, this is where it started. <laughs> Uh, eventually, we made the transition to text in bits so that instead of uh, handling a board like this, you would do it textually. There were a lot of programmers who were really uncomfortable with that. I can't trust a program that I can't hold in my hands. Uh, the, they wanted the tactileness thing because they weren't confident they could make anything else work. Uh, from plug boards, we leaped to symbolic assembly language, which you know, is when it really becomes software. Uh, the next leap was to high-level languages, COBOL and FORTRAN, uh, ALGOL, BASIC. The next leap was to structured programming. Um, basically, we got away from go-tos there and started seeing language, more modern languages like C and Pascal. And then uh, we're just now solidly into the object-oriented phase. And, and this has been really slow. Let's look at the, the history of object-oriented programming. 
first object-oriented programming language was developed in Norway. It was called Simula. Had classes, objects, inheritance, very familiar with what we're doing now. Alan Kay saw that, thought, wow, those are some really powerful ideas, incorporated them into the Smalltalk project at Xerox PARC. Uh, Smalltalk shipped in 1980, um, but was too radical for um, the market at that time and got virtually no acceptance, which is a shame because it's still one of the best programming languages ever invented. Um, uh, five years later, Bell Labs uh, released C++, which took the ideas from Smalltalk but embedded them into C. A decade later, we got Java, which took the C++ ideas but removed backward compatibility to C in, the, in exchange for greater reliability. Um, and then a decade later, we see Java's object model uh, you know, migrate into uh, PHP. Now, if we look at this chronology, um, 67 is about the time that we started to be aware of the software crisis. And at that time, we were um, just beginning the high-level languages transition. Um, uh, Algol had only come out in 1960. Um, about half the industry was still doing assembly language. Simula was a huge leap. I mean, it got high-level languages. It got, um, let's look at the list again. High-level languages, it got structured programming and object-oriented programming. But it took 30 years for it to get accepted. Um, and so we saw a lot of leapfrogging between these phases. But on average, they tend to, to get adopted every 20 years. We're now in the process of service-oriented systems. So, and we've seen a bunch of failures and, and missteps in this. Uh, we've seen CORBA and JMI and uh, SOAP and a whole bunch of other stuff. But we can be pretty confident that that's going to be where it is um, in the next leap. And, and we're in the process of making that happen. But again, it's slow and, and uncertain. But I'm pretty confident we're going to end up there. And I think Yahoo's probably going to be instrumental in, in helping to decide what that actually turns out to be. Um, now, one of the reasons why there's been skepticism and slowness in adopting the new technologies is that some of these leaps have failed. Uh, for example, artificial uh, intelligence was going to change everything, didn't. Uh, fifth generation languages were going to completely change the way we think about programming, uh, computer aided software engineering, uh, subjective oriented programming. All of these things are really good ideas, and there was an expectation that they would all succeed, but they didn't. So some of the leaps have worked, some of them haven't. Uh, by far the biggest disappointment here was, was artificial intelligence, in which the solution of the software problem was going to be that we'll let the computers write the software for us. If we can teach the machines how to write programs, then we won't have to write the programs, and they should do a better job than we can. Uh, in retrospect, that was a remarkably silly idea, but it, it would have been really nice had it worked. Uh, um, software does not have enough self-awareness to be afraid of bugs which is why it works as well as it does. Uh, this was an insight, I think, that the artificial intelligence guys didn't have, and, and I think that's why it didn't work. Uh, speaking of bugs, the first mention in the English language of bugs in a technical context was from the uh, Pall Mall Gazette in 1889. Uh, Mr. Edison, I was informed, had been up the two previous nights discovering a bug in the phonograph. Um, that use of bug uh, eventually migrated into computer programming uh, from engineering. Uh, this is maybe the world's most famous bug. Um, in, in 1945, Grace Hopper was a programmer on the Mark II, uh, making ballistics tables for the Navy. Um, and in panel 70, or panel F in relay 70, they actually found a moth that had gotten trapped in one of the relays. Uh, so she pulled it out and taped it into her notebook. And her notebook is now in the Smithsonian. Uh, this, this is the first computer bug, which was actually an insect. <laughs> so recognizing the importance of the uh, software crisis, industry looked for help and solutions. And so we've had a tradition for the last 40 years of snake oil of various kinds being sold to um, the software development industry, claiming to fix the problem. Um, and there have been all sorts of things, use of particular languages or particular tools or particular methodologies or particular uh, 
documentation patterns. I, I saw some people who said, you know, if you put a certain kind of picture into your specifications, you're going to be golden. Um, it, or if you have all of your meetings standing up, there's no way you can fail. <laughs> Eventually, the industry figured out there are no silver bullets. I guess imagining that software is a, a werewolf that, that you have to magically kill. And so none of that stuff works, um, which is a shame because it'd be nice if we had some methodology which we could say, absolutely, this will make sure that we get the software finished on time and it will be of sufficient quality. Um, but there have been some important steps. I think not all of them have gotten uh, the respect that they deserve. Uh, Frederick Brooks wrote what may still be the best book on computer software project management, The Mythical Man Month in 1975. Brooks managed the uh, OS 360 project at IBM. And uh, that project was late, over budget, didn't have all the features, performance was bad, you know, it had all these things. Eventually they got it working several revs later. Uh, but he spent a lot of time thinking about what went wrong with IBM, uh, why did the project turn out the way he did? So uh, he wrote this wonderful book. Um, you know, the book is now 30 years old, so some of it is, is not com as relevant as it was, but it's surprisingly on target still. Uh, he came up with Brooks's Law, which is um, adding manpower to a late software project makes it later. Um, the reason for that is that um, as your experienced programmers get uh, taken off the line in order to teach the new guys, the new guys are not going to be productive for a long time. So basically what you've done is taken your best guys offline and have no one to replace them. Um, there are lots of other really interesting insights about uh, project management and scheduling in the book. Uh, the book is often read, often quoted, but very rarely um, uh, used. Uh, he talked about the second system effect which is that when you've got some programmers who've been very successful on a project or some architects who've been very successful and give them free reign on another project, the, there's a tendency that the next project, because of their uh, confidence, uh, will overreach and they will put too much complexity into it and it will fail. I have seen this effect and it, it is heartbreaking to see people who've had uh, a great success then follow on with something which is not successful. He talked a lot about prototyping. The way he recommended that we make systems, uh, complex systems, is first build a prototype, then throw it away, um, and then make the real one using the experience that you gained in writing the prototype. He said that software is like waffles. You'll throw away the first one, and that's just the cost of making software. I think he was right, but it's very, very difficult for management to throw anything away when they look at the cost of a development. And we'll look at some of the implications of that in a minute. Um, he also uh, answered the question, how does a software project become a year late? And the answer is it, it gets late a day at a time. Um, Donald Knuth of Stanford University came up with literate programming, which I think is another brilliant advance in software, but very, very few people have adopted it. Um, he designs uh, a software so that he can either run it through a program generator and execute it, or he can run it through uh, a, a book binder and print it. So he's making the book about the software concurrently with uh, the documentation. This goes way past the ideas in, in Javadoc, in which we're trying to automatically make um, an API listing. He's got the deep documentation about the program, uh, the motivation behind it, the reasoning behind it, and how all of the intricate pieces fit together. So, uh, if, if you ever read any of his books, they're absolutely brilliant. Um, nobody's figured out how to do this stuff in large teams yet, which I think is one of the reasons why we don't see much adoption, but I think it's absolutely brilliant. Um, some people have observed that there's a significant difference in the capabilities of one programmer versus another. I mean, the, there are some programmers who are at least 10 times more productive than other programmers. They're, they're just, they have amazing skill or amazing experience. For some reason, they're just a whole lot better than everybody else. Um, and as the number of programmers becomes bigger, meaning that more people enter the pool, a lot of them are often not well suited or not well trained. Uh, some critics have claimed that the uh, difference is closer to a factor of 100 than a factor of 10. Um, 
but we don't pay any attention to that in the way that we manage projects. Um, so that uh, the guy who's 10 times better, 100 times better, we tend to pay him the same, tend to manage him the same, tend to yoke him with guys who are not as successful as him, and pretty much drag him down to their level so that you're only getting a tenth of his capability, so, or a hundredth of his capability. So um, Harlan Mills of, of IBM proposed the surgical team. His model was um, the surgery. You know, so you've got a surgeon who's there, and he has to work really fast. So you build a team around him so that he has absolutely no distractions. So he spends 100% of, of his time doing what he alone can do um, and being as efficient as possible so that he has the greatest likelihood of completing the surgery uh, while the patient's still alive. Uh, so Mills proposed doing the same thing with programmers. So you get your very best programmer, and you build a team around him which allows him to be as efficient as he possibly could be. Um, Mills' proposal was 30 years ago, so the team that he put around him was different than the one that I think we would have today. So this is my suggestion for who would be on the team. You've got a co-pilot because you need someone to uh, cover for the lead guy if, if something happens to him. Also, the lead guy needs someone he can talk to in a deep way about what he's thinking. Uh, so you've got a, a co-pilot there, a peer. Uh, you've got a technical writer, you've got a language lawyer, someone who can explain about the deep structure of the tools that you're using. Um, you'll have a buildmeister, a toolsmith, testers, interns, any, you know, whatever it takes to make this guy 100% effective at developing software. And that this one guy can build systems much faster than any team. Interesting proposal. It's been around for a long time. Uh, there have been one or two projects that used it, mostly uh, it's too radical. Nobody's ever looked at it. Um, one snake oil idea that has worked is incrementalism. Uh, it's also called Agile, and it's got a whole bunch of other names, which is basically um, we don't want to schedule a project to take a year because it goes over time. It's going to cost us two years, and that's a huge hit. So let's instead schedule it to go a week or a month. And then if it goes over time, it's only two weeks or two months, we can survive that. Um, so we're seeing a lot of that, and, and it does avoid a lot of the pitfalls that we saw in the older projects. So uh, if you're going to fail, you're going to fail fast, and failing fast is a whole lot cheaper than failing slow. Um, and often you have successes, and also you're in a better position to handle feedback because you know, your customers and market can get back into the process uh, very quickly. So there are a whole lot of benefits that come from rapid incrementalism. Um, so as a consequence, we're now in perpetual beta. We never finish anything. But that means that um, the part of the software crisis which said that uh, the programs were unmaintainable now becomes really key because we're spending now virtually 100% of our time in program maintenance. And so we really have to be good at making programs that are maintainable. And that's not something that, that often happens in this model. Uh, this is a picture I, I shot at the Winchester house. Uh, Sarah Winchester was another incrementalist. Um, <laughs> in fact, Sarah Winchester operated a whole lot like a software company. Um, she believed that if she stopped building her house, she would die, much as a software company might believe if we stop revving our software, we will die. Um, so for 40 years, she had a team of contractors working on her house 24 hours a day, 365, constantly building because she believed that that was necessary. Um, she spent a lot of time remodeling, but in some cases, um, things like this happen. And on the tour, this is a, in case you don't recognize it, this is a stairway that just goes up into the ceiling, it's just completely broken stairway. Um, and on the tour, they go, oh, she did that to confuse ghosts or something like that. But if you're a programmer, it's absolutely obvious what happened here. <laughs> This is, what, this is the consequence of incrementalism. Um, here's another example. Um, it, here's a chimney that goes about two feet shy of the ceiling. Now, how did this happen? Again, it, it, if, if you understand how software is managed, this makes perfect sense. Um, the chimney builders were late. Rainy season was coming. Sarah said, get the roof on. Um, we've got to ship the roof now. 
and the builders are saying, oh, wait a minute, we haven't finished the chimney yet. And she says, I don't care. <laughs> I've already got lots of chimneys in the house. I'm not having any rain in my house. Put the roof up, we'll fix it later. Um, and she died, and, and they never finished it. Uh, um, again, a lot of software is built exactly the same way. Um, so um, I, I see there's a, a triad of skills involved in, in building software projects. Uh, the first is the skill of the programmer. Um, and it's good that that's in the triad because that's the one we can do the most about. And that's why we're all here. I mean, basically part of being a programmer is educating yourself and re-educating yourself every day. I mean, there's so much new practice to go on. We're constantly developing, thinking, practicing, experiencing, getting better at our skills, and we need to keep doing that. Um, any, all the investment that we make as a company into making ourselves better, all of our personal investments in making ourselves better programmers, all really good investments. Then there's a the technology that we have to work with. And unfortunately, in the case of the browser, it's pretty crappy. Um, so much of what makes our jobs difficult um, on top of the problem of the, of the software crisis is that it's just really hard working in these systems because they are so random and so variable and, and inconsistent and unreliable. Um, we are beginning to have an effect on that, though. Uh, Yahoo's developed some very good relationships with the, the uh, browser makers. Um, and we are going to be working directly with them in the next stage of, of the evolution of the web. If, if you guys were here last week when we had the, the Browser Wars uh, conference, um, we were extremely friendly with all three of the major browser makers, and we're going to continue that. So uh, that, in the short term, that's, there's not any good news to report. But in the long term, I think we have a prospect for things getting significantly better. Then there's requirements. Uh, the thing that is so wonderful about software is that you can change your mind and change the software and it does something different. That, that's why it's software. Um, unfortunately, there are consequences to changing the requirements. Um, and, and they tend to have negative effects on the quality of the software. So if, if we can get more in tune with the capabilities of the technology, the capabilities of our developers, um, in the making of our requirements, we can get better systems and reduce the risk of failure. The best movie ever made about project management is Mr. Blanding's Builds His Dream House. Uh, 1948, you got to see this movie. Uh, if you've ever been on a project or ever managed a project or seen a project, uh, this will make a whole lot of sense to you. Um, Cary Grant and Myrna Loy play a nice uh, couple from New York who want to build a nice home in the country. Um, they have the good fortune of hiring a very good architect and a very good uh, set of contractors, so they have the skills part. Um, but they don't have much technology, tech, technical knowledge about home building. Uh, so as a result, they have very poor quality over um, their decisions about um, requirements. And some of the, uh, a lot of hilarity ensues from uh, some of their unfortunate specifications. Um, you got to see it. I, I was going to show you a clip, but I uh, don't have time, and I, I didn't want to infringe any copyrights. Uh, so I, I highly recommend you go out and see it. It's really, really good. Um, so one of the things that the Blandings learned was that features have cost, and you have to account for the costs when you're putting together your requirements. So in software, it's obviously that you're going to pay a non-recurring cost in development time and recurring cost and deployment, you know, bandwidth and, and servers and so on. Um, we often don't account for the maintenance cost, that uh, we're going to add bloat and corrupt to the system, and that's going to uh, have an impact that is recurring. Um, and as we talk about performance, we also know, know that there is now a download cost. Um, there's also a user confusion cost, and that they're now having to deal with all these extra features and may not be aware of what they're supposed to do, or they may actually make operation of, of the program more complicated. And also, features become a, a vector for bug delivery. And we have to consider that potential as well. Um, Yahoo is a whole lot of kinds of companies. You know, we're an advertising company, we're a media company, we're a community company, and all of that. 
We're also a software company. I mean, the evidence is that we've got a whole lot of programmers here writing a whole lot of software. Basically, that's what we do. A significant fraction of our valuation is based on the state of our code base. A low quality code base is a liability. Um, so any improvements we can make to the quality of the code base increase the quality of the company significantly. There are two views we can take on, on code quality. There's the micro view, in which we look at the coding conventions, and then there's the macro view, in which we look at the program architecture. Both are equally important, and, and we'll consider both. So the simplest thing we can do to enhance the value of our code base is to make our programs more readable. Uh, because that, our ability to read our programs is the thing that gives the code base value. And let me give you an example. Um, on the left are what I consider badly written uh, chunks of JavaScript, and on the right are good chunks. Now the JavaScript compiler sees them as identical. It doesn't care. It'll, it'll run them both exactly the same way. But uh, for, the one, for the good ones, it's obvious looking at it which ones are invocations and which ones aren't. Um, now a good programmer is going to know, is going to be able to read that one too. You can puzzle it out and go, oh, your space is in the wrong place, but I know what it means. But it does slow down your ability to read and understand the program. And this is just one aspect of the program. Uh, if there are a lot of other rules that we can apply, which will add more uh, typographic conventions, which make the thing easier to understand. And the better we can understand our programs, the better we can manipulate them successfully. So uh, toward that, this year we will be adopting a Yahoo JavaScript coding convention, and we are going to require it on all projects. And the motivation for doing this is so that all of us can read all of our stuff together and make it easier for us to share and to help each other go forward. Um, so programs are not just a technical contrivance. Programs are a medium of intentional communication. Obviously, we're, com we're communicating detailed instructions with the machine. But more importantly, we're communicating with our development community and ultimately communicating with yourself that in the process of programming, you're making thousands of decisions. Some of them are obvious and, and trivial, but some of them are really deep and complicated. And it's hard to remember, uh, even hours later, why you did things that you did. And sometimes when you have to come back to some code some period of time later, you look at it and go, who is the idiot who wrote that? Um, so you need to leave trails for yourself so that you can understand it. And uh, writing the programs clearly is the best thing you can do to, to make the, the programs usable as you go forward. So that's the macro view, or the micro view, now the macro view. Good architecture is necessary to give programs enough structure to be able to grow large without collapsing into a puddle of confusion. And I'm sure you've all seen that happen, and it's pretty discouraging when it does. Um, so uh, we need to, to structure our program as well. Particularly because the task now before us, because we are so incremental, is changing a, one correct program into another correct program. Um, and that's much more easily done if the originating program is a very high quality. It's very difficult to do if the first one is of low quality, even if you wrote it yourself. One of the consequences of, of bad programming is that we get cruft, which I, I, I think of as software scar tissue. And the older a program gets, the more you've done surgery on it, the more cuts you've put on it, the more of this cruft it gets. And there are lots of causes for it. One of them is premature optimization. It, um, you, you remove generality from the program. You add more cases, which means there are more flow paths. And you might not catch all the things that have to change when you're, when you're making modifications. Sometimes it's due to in inexperience, either with the technology or with the subject matter. Invariably, the more we work with this stuff, the better we understand it. And so when we go back to programs, we're going to recognize, ah, I, I got that wrong. Um, sometimes it's due to misreading the source. Again, because the source is sloppy or, or poorly formatted, uh, you may not have seen all of the places where a relevant change needs to touch. Um, and so that uh, increases cruft. Uh, feature enhancement automatically adds cruft because you're often adding features which were not anticipated in the original design. And if you don't re-engineer it, uh, then you have to tack stuff on in, in unexpected ways. Then finally, the biggest cause of, of cruft is the death march. You know, like, like uh, 
uh, Mrs. Winchester's uh, chimney. We don't have time to do it right, just get it done. It, it, if getting it right is not an option, then Cruft is definitely going to be the result. Um, a, a relatively new form of Cruft is bloat. This is something that was not possible back when the software crisis was first identified because in those days a computer totally would only have 64K in it or maybe 8K in it or 4K in it. So the program had to fit or it wouldn't work. And so part of the process of programming was figuring out how to refactor your program to get it in size. Um, and very often as a result of doing that, you would introduce bugs because you'd take a correct program and try to turn it into another program which is significantly smaller. And that, that's really hard to do. So the good news when more allowed memories to get really big was we didn't have to do that stuff anymore. And that made the craft of programming a whole lot easier. Unfortunately, it also made bloat easier. It's possible now to have multiple copies of the same code within one image um, and not even be aware of it. And one of the ways that happens is you've got several programmers on a team and they all recognize, I need a, a class that does this kind of thing. And because you have inadequate communication in the project, they all write one because it's not that complicated. Or maybe they didn't, weren't able to read the code because the code was sloppy, didn't realize there was already something in there that did that. Uh, we've seen lots of cases even on our own site. For example, there are three sets of, of cookie methods on one page, often adjacent to each other. Um, th that stuff really needs to be taken out because it, it, it makes going forward harder because which one, if you need to make a change because we find a security problem with cookies, how do you know that you changed all of the places where it needs to change? You got too much code you have to look at. Um, we also have cases of insecurity. And the bigger the code is, the more complicated the code is, the harder it is to think about its security properties. And so one of the ways that we make our programs more secure is to make our programs simpler. Only simplicity allows us to reason correctly. One bit of good news about that is that good security-oriented thinking uh, programming is good programming. The sorts of things that you do to make your program more reliable uh, you know, in terms of information hiding and modularization turns out just to be really good anyway. So if you're doing really good security programming, you're doing really good programming. And we need to all get much better at doing that. Um, just like I said. Um, so why is Cruft bad? Well, as Cruft accumulates, complexity grows, and progress slows. So eventually the code base itself becomes a huge source of fiction, it, friction. It takes more and more people to make incrementally smaller, smaller changes. And so in each sprint, you find you're adding less and less and less, and it's costing more and more and more. And eventually it's going to get to the point where progress becomes impossible. Um, so you have to consider refactoring. Uh, refactoring is a process of code refinement. Um, and there are lots of levels of it that we can do. One of them is correction of formatting. Uh, that's always the best place to start. If you can make the code readable, you've got a better chance of understanding where its problems are and, and how to make further corrections. Um, you insert documentation where it's necessary. You remove the cruft and the bloat. And in some cases, you restructure it in order to give it a structure which can better accommodate new features. Um, you, you all know how I love to quote scripture. So here's a little bit from Exodus 23. Plant and harvest your crops for six years, but let the land rest and lie fallow during the seventh year. Now, letting software lie fallow doesn't do any good. I'll, I'll, it doesn't get better on its own. Um, it, it, you might experience some bit rot, actually, as the systems and layers below it mutate, and then suddenly it doesn't work anymore. But I think it'd be a really good idea if every seventh sprint we add no new features, and we just look at the code and go, okay, what damage did we do in the last six? And let's clean that up and get it good and solid so that we're ready for the next sprint. So I, I would consider us doing this kind of maintenance on our code base on an ongoing basis. Uh, but sometimes the code is in such a state that you just can't do that. And, and you have to consider starting over. This is a horrible, unthinkable thought. Um, because we've all experienced the pain of the crash, where uh, you've been working and your system dies or there's a power failure or it's stolen or the backups fail or something happens and you've lost it and there's 
almost nothing more painful than that because you can kind of flash back onto those thousands of decisions that you've made and what's the likelihood that you could ever repeat that series of decisions and get them all right in the same way. It's just too horrible to think about. Um, Similarly, um, project managers have a problem with that as well. They've paid so much in blood in order to get the software to the state it's in, and they imagine that that cost was necessary, that there was no alternative because they managed the project right, so that really was the cost of that code, and they can't afford to pay that again. Um, but I, I, I think there's another way to think about it. Um, an experienced team can cross that ground again very, very quickly because there is no inertia if they're starting over. Um, but you have to make sure that the focus is on simplicity. Otherwise, you may see the second system effect and you'll end up with a new failure. There have been cases of that where, okay, we'll make a new system and the new system never gets completed. Um, but I think it's possible to manage this so that you just do the good stuff, the stuff that you need to know how to do, the stuff that you've already done and have a very deep understanding of. Um, um, I, I've had some experience with this myself. Um, I was the founder of a software company a few years ago, and we'd spent uh, many years developing um, a client server system, really nice stuff. Um, and then we left that company, and we wanted to start another company doing similar things, and we tried to negotiate to get the IP, but we couldn't. So it was like, okay, well, but we know how to do it. Um, so we replicated the first system, except we just got everything right. Um, and we did it in four months, something that we had previously spent years doing, just knocked it out because we knew how to do it. We left out all the cruft, left out all the stuff that we knew we didn't need, didn't make any of the mistakes that we made before. Um, and as things happened, um, we lost control of that company, and then uh, we found occasion to do it again. And it was like, oh man, we just don't want to do this again because we remembered you know, all those other experiences and weren't confident that we could get it right again. Two weeks. We're, we were able to do it again in two weeks, and it kicked ass. Really, really high quality. Um, so I believe that it is possible to recreate software in significantly less time with the same team than it took to do the first one. And in some cases where the code base gets so out of control, I think it is the right decision. So now we get to the conclusion. It's got to be always quality first and quality last. Code's got to be readable or it has no uh, forward going value. Um, I, one of the ways that we can get better code is by doing design reviews. I recommend that we uh, do peer reviews on our stuff all the time. Part of our social programming time should be spent in reading each other's code. Uh, very, very good investment. Um, also inviting others to, to come out. Uh, you can engage with my group, the Ajax Strike Force. We're happy to come out and, and do reviews for you. There are lots of other groups in the company that can do that as well. Um, we can look at designs, look at code and keep learning. We, we, we all have to constantly be getting smarter at this stuff, and it's all going to pay off. And that's how quality happens. So thank you very much. <laughs>